Hello, I'm Nicola Pomponi, your host for the Wind Vane webinar. Thank you for joining us. We are so excited to be able to virtually travel to California. Direct from Carneros, we are live at Wind Vane with our winemaker, Stephen Erberg, and business development manager, Lauren Vigil. Hi, everyone. Morning. Morning. <laughs> Thanks for uh, having me on this morning to talk about Wind Vane and our estate vineyards here and and taste through the wines and, and talk about them with you this morning yep thank you i'm really enjoying uh being here talking about wind fame uh been tasting this wine for quite a few vintages and it's a pleasure to be speaking to the story a little bit more well great we have so many questions so why don't we just jump right in i'm going to begin with lauren's lauren why don't you tell us a little bit about how wind vein was created yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, this wine really was created to express that Carneros terroir. Uh, our estate is on the Sonoma side of Carneros, and we really wanted to, you know, create a wine that showcased the unique estate. So, you know, we have that Petaluma gap that Steve will be speaking to a little bit later and those winds um, that create really intense fruit. Uh, we've chose different sites uh, on the estate that really have kind of that stress put that stress on the vines so you know we're looking for those steep um rocky vineyards and i think um you know one of the things that really shows that is the logo as well so i know um i know this is backwards a little bit but if you take a look at the logo you have the ram on this weather vane that really speaks to the winds um as well as you know the ram represents los carneros so i think that's awesome um, the other great thing I think um, about these wines is they are so uh, boutique, you know, we don't produce that many cases. These two right here, we don't produce um, too many cases, but this one is really special. We only produce 100 cases each vintage and every single bottle is labeled uh, with bottle number right here. So I think that's lovely. We actually could read the label. Um, you might see it backwards, but we saw it perfectly. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Uh, tell us, Lauren, where, where exactly is Wind Vane located? So Wind Vane is in the uh, east uh, side of Carneros in on in Sonoma, right uh, near, yep, I was going to say right near Highway 37. We have kind of two parts of our state that kind of give us some, you know, differentiation to the uh, vineyards and and uh, there's some influences correct with uh, with exactly where it is uh, with the location of uh, wind vane is that correct what what influences uh, this wine yeah. yeah the San Pablo Bay I think Steve will speak to the you know influences a little bit more later but definitely those winds you know truly define this wine I think um, you know your Steve will speak to it a little bit more as well but I think the fog really um, plays a huge role to create a uh, the grapes that we're using for these wines. Fantastic. Um, whenever we, we speak of wind vane, we, we speak of Carneros and that's exactly where uh, the winery is in Carneros, correct? Correct. <laughs> and Carneros is uh, also spread into Napa. So we always wanna make sure we're letting everyone know that the winery is a split between, uh, excuse me, the uh, actual AVA is a split between Napa and Sonoma. And we happen to be in the Sonoma part portion. So Steve, tell us, tell us a little bit about the varietals that are planted. Well, I'm, I'm going to take a step back and, and talk a little bit more about the, uh, about the wind and, and the location of, of the vineyards in, in Carneros. And um, wind vane, really, to talk about wind vane, it, it, it's a story of the wind. We, we, we named it for the wind that really defines the climate where we're growing our, our, our estate fruit here. And to talk about the wind and, and the climate in, in our spot on the very westernmost edge of the Carneros area, it, we, we need to start in the ocean. So let, let's take a look at the slide number two. So um, to begin with, we need to think about the ocean off the, the west coast of California. So you see on the left side of this slide, we can see the ocean currents that come in to the west coast of the United States. And in Northern California, we get our water from the far north. We get cold currents that come in 
traveling to the east, hit the west coast of the United States and travel down through the south. So you can see on that image there with Monterey Bay, you can see all of that water that's coming in from the far north, very cold water coming down across Washington and Oregon to California with these cold currents. This cools down the ocean off the coast of Northern California considerably relative to Central or Southern California. You can see as that current travels to the south, it moves off into the ocean and you get down around uh, LA and San Diego, that uh, cool water is dissipated and they're getting some water that's coming up from the south to keep them warm. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide, you can see ocean temperatures. So if you look up, you can see the San Francisco Bay there, kind of in the middle of the slide. And the blue color on that is cold and the red is, is warm. So you see down in Southern California where they have much warmer water, we've got cold water off the coast of Northern California, especially just north of that San Francisco Bay. As all of that cold water comes in and hits the west coast, the even the, the deeper cool water wells up to the surface right along the coastline, which brings the water temperatures along our coast down to about in, in the 50s, pretty much all year round. So even when the weather gets warm inland, um, that, that ocean is still cold. So in the summertime, we will see warmer temperatures in the Central Valley in, in the middle of the state, and it can get very hot in there. All of that hot air gets light and travels up, which pulls in the cold air off the ocean. So all of the areas that are close to the coast are going to get that, that marine layer comes in, that, that marine influence, that cold, moist air that comes in rolling off the ocean. So if we scroll down uh, to slide number four, you can see what the effect of that is. So every afternoon in the summertime, and it gets even more intense the warmer it gets in the Central Valley, um, you can see on the far left-hand side there at noon, you can see all of that, the low clouds, the fog, the marine hanging off the ocean to the west, and three in the afternoon is typically when the wind will start to pick up. So as that marine layer starts rolling in, it gets funneled in through the Petaluma Gap. Now that's an area of low lying areas in between the hills that really funnel this entire marine layer breeze that's coming in into a, a little wind tunnel that, that blasts right to the westernmost edge of the Carneros uh, region. So you can see by 6 p.m. there, there's that little pinch point where all of this wind, this cool wind, so this is air, cool, moist air in, in the 50s carrying this, this low cloud cover and this, this fog comes rolling in by 6 p.m. in Carneros, we've got cloud cover and uh, the air is cooled down and uh, that creates a nice cool environment then for growing our cool climate varieties, which are Chardonnay and, and Pinot Noir. So that means that our, our little spot at our estate there is much cooler than areas that are just a little bit to the north of us uh, going further up valley in either Sonoma Valley or in, in, in Napa Valley. The, the Carneros area that bridges in between Napa and Sonoma is, is really the coolest area of, of both of those area of Appalachians. And then you'll see by on the right hand side, by the time we get to uh, the evening, uh, we've got nice cool air through the night. So even if we've got hot days in the daytime in the 90s or 100s, by the time we get at night, we're looking at temperatures in the 50s, pretty much every night through the, through the summertime. And that cool air slows down the ripening of those cool climate varieties, slows the maturity, allows them to hang out there for longer and develop those more in, in intense characters that we really love. So really uh, that, that wind that comes hauling over the hills every afternoon, and it's a, it's a pretty serious wind as well that really defines our area. And from that, we took, we took the name wind vane. And where we're gonna plant our grapevines are up towards the top of the, the ridge of those hills where that Petaluma Gap is opening into Carneros. We've 
try to find the the most suitable site up there for our our most intense um, vines of, of Pinot Noir and, and Chardonnay. We got steep hillsides up there with thin rocky soils that are very well drained. These soils and and that wind uh, challenge those grapevines and challenged grapevines produce these wonderful small berries, small cropped and intensely flavored fruit and ripen slow enough to get the depth of character that we're really looking for. It's amazing. I was, uh, I've been spending a little time at the winery and it's just amazing how the wind just begins to howl uh, at a certain hour and the, the temperature just uh, drops. And I, I can't imagine, I'm not a, uh, I can't, I, I can just imagine how it affects the, the vineyards and it's just the, the coolest thing ever. Yeah, it's really, it's really the, the, the perfect spot for, for the grapes that we have planted here. Well, great. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how the, the wind vane wines are made? Well, um, why don't we, why don't we taste through them and we can talk about how, how each one of them is made as, as we're going through. Perfect. So, Let's start off with the uh, wind vane Chardonnay. Okay. And please, if anyone has any questions, um, I know there's a few uh, that have come in already on the chat. Go ahead and uh, type them into the chat and I'll uh, jump in and ask a few questions while they're tasting. But go ahead, Steve and uh, Lauren. Well, uh, first of all, all of our grapes are picked by hand, no machine harvesting. We're, we're, in, we're growing in hillsides and in spots where you, you couldn't even really get a machine harvester in there if, if you wanted to. And we'll pick the grapes at night. So we want to get these grapes off of the grapevines uh, when it's cool out. We'll bring them in as, as whole clusters for the Chardonnay. Everything is picked by hand, whole cluster pressed, no destemming, no crushing. We want to have the, the, the most gentle approach to, to getting our, our juice out of those grapes as possible. And the Chardonnay uh, is 100% barrel fermented and 100% French oak. You definitely get some of that on the nose. Certainly so. And we will age that wine for about nine months in the French oak. Steve, but, the French oak, is it new or used? Well, we use only about 25% new oak in there. Uh, what I want to accomplish with the wine is not to have the winemaking uh, style or characteristics to be driven uh, for, for the characters in the wine. We want the, the vineyard to express its own character. So when we try this wine, we're getting a lot of that ripe tropical fruit. It's got this pineapple tropical character, this ripe peach stone fruit on top of, you know, we got that wonderful green apple, bright crispness. That's all, that's all characteristic of our, our estate Chardonnay in, in Carneros where we are. And I want to put all of that up front. I want that to be the character of the wine and, and define the style of the wine rather than winemaking choices. And the amount of new French oak is, is a winemaking choice. We could, we could put a lot of oak in there and have it very oaky, but I, that's not what we want to do. The oak is there to elevate the fruit to frame the fruit, put it into context, but not to define the character of the wine. So you can pick up the oak in there. It gives a little bit of toastiness, which is, which is nice, but it's not it's not an oaky wine. And by the one same token- get, One question we get often, Steve, is how, how, how much of the Chardonnay goes through malolactic fermentation? And for the, for the malolactic, this gets about 30%. So, uh, I want to maintain the brightness of the wine. It should be crisp and bright, but I, I don't. I want to. I want to use a little bit of of the ML to take take a little bit of the edge off of it. Uh, contribute some creaminess. I don't want to go so far with the ML that it's going to be a, a the wine is going to get soft or or flat, and I don't want it to get buttery. I just want a little bit of creaminess, a little more texture, a little more mouthfeel to it, but not, not go overboard with that. So just like with the oak, we want it to be an accent to, to elevate the fruit, but not to uh, define the character of the wine. Lauren, uh, tell us 
a little bit about uh, pairing this wine. What would you pair this wine with? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, the tropical fruits that kind of Steve spoke to that are characteristic of this wine definitely would pair well with like a white fish or, you know, a fruit salsa, pineapple, mango, um, that kind of thing to really highlight those flavors. I think the other thing is it does have that softness that he was speaking to. So, you know, it can certainly hold up to a little bit of spice, a stir fry with, you know, chili or ginger. Uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a harsh spice, but ginger, something like that, that brings to it. Um, you know, I think those would pair really well. Excellent. That that sound, those all sounded really good. <laughs> wow. Especially swirling around this glass, tasting this wine. I, I can just imagine how it would go with that uh, little spicy and or that ginger. Delicious. Let's taste the Pinot Noir. All right. So the Pinot also, all hand harvested at night. We get out there at 2 a.m., Take some lights out there, start picking the fruit. Fruit comes into the winery and we will just stem and lightly crush. It'll get a cold soak for two days before we inoculate it. Fermentation takes a, usually less than two weeks to finish and then it all goes into 100% French oak also. And like the Chardonnay, we don't want the oak to be overpowering. We don't want it to be the overall defining character here. So this gets about 40% new oak and will age again for about, about nine months before we, we blend and bottle it. That's what, uh, whenever I take wines out to to customers, I mean, I literally write exactly what you just stated. The, the nine months, the 40%, um, the estate fruit, it's uh, it's great to hear these little detailed facts because these are the most important facts that people are asking for. And this will be a blend of several clones from, you know, the, the very the very best spots that we have up uh, on, on those, those steep hillsides. Uh, we've got about 12 clones that we're growing widely. Uh, this blend is getting about five five or six different clones of, of our favorites, but some of the ones that really, really stand out are the, the, the Dijon 115, Martini, Pomard, Ladensville. Uh, we've got a clone called Colmar 538 that I don't know that there's a whole lot of other people growing, but this is one that we've discovered that we really, really enjoy the, the character that it contributes. The, the Colmar is a very, very balanced, balanced clone that produces a wine that has a wonderful mouthfeel. It has got a lot of spice and, and has earth and, and good solid red fruit as well. Something that, that has a lot of great characters in, in its own. Some of the other clones like the Dijon 115 comes in, has a lot of tannin, has a lot of dark black fruit, uh, some solid earth to it. It's a, it's a very uh, substantial wine has a, a big backbone to it, which is a great contributor. Uh, the Martini clone gives us a lot of nice uh, jammy fruit, and uh, and the Pomard can give us some nice spice from 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 where it's located in in the vineyard. So we like to take each of these different clones, and they all have the their own thing to contribute to the blend. And when we put them all together, we really create something that that's greater than the the sum of the parts. So this one really delivers a lot of that wonderful red fruit, that, that black, red and black cherry in there. Great Pinot Noir spice. And, uh, you know, a little bit of um, sort of cedary forest floor, give it a little bit of earthiness to it. All the, all the things I like in there, the, the wine is bright enough to, to stand up to all of that. And it's got a beautiful texture. Really making Pinot Noir is is a exercise in in balance and and texture. You you don't want to get too overboard with the fruit or uh, get over extracted or or too big. You throw the wine out of balance. You you need to you need to have everything in balance to create the wine that that you'd like to have. Lauren, tell us uh, a little bit what you would pair this wine with. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, Steve hit the, hit the nail on the head with uh, speaking to, you know, it's got those fruit flavors, but it's also got kind of that earthiness. Um, so, you know, it, it's got the tannin. So I think something a little bit fattier would definitely hold up to it, like a pork belly um, and maybe a Bing cherry sauce to kind of complement those fruit flavors you've got. Uh, you know, you could also do something a little more casual, like a taco with carnitas or something. And, you know, a cotilla cheese, a little bit saltier. Um, this wine could definitely hold up to that. Um, even a burger, you know, a blue cheese burger or something like that, those bigger flavors, I think the fruit in this does uh, complement those too. Well, yeah, that's perfect because I actually happen to be having uh, ta carnitas tacos for breakfast right now. So this is one really excellent. <laughs> the perfect pairing. Perfect. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. I usually have that every morning. Uh, let's taste really a little awesome. bit of the reserve and tell me a little bit about uh, the reserve. Let's let's do that. Man, we're getting some good questions. So I have lots of questions to ask um, afterwards. This is great. Thank you. Okay. So the reserve wine, this is a barrel select. So uh, winemaking, basically similar to how, how we make the, uh, the, the core wine. But this, this one gives me the opportunity to just make 100 cases. So I'm going to run through all of the barrels that we have and select my very favorite spots in the vineyard and then from those lots go through and taste all of the barrels and select the very favorite barrels to do a uh, small barrel select blend which is um, always a joy to be able to uh, skim a little of that off the top and make you know the very best wine that that you'd, you'd love to make and this wine's got a lot of intensity to it. Coming in with that wonderful mouthfeel and, and, and substantial, but still silky and, and having a really nice texture to it. It's got a lot of that wonderful black fruit in there, blackberry, black cherry, some brightness as well. And that wonderful spice. And almost like a little bit of mocha or cocoa on the finish too, which I really like Absolutely. how that that wraps up. Yes. Yeah. This is this wine. This this is a wine that's a joy to make. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people ask what what separates the reserve from the Carneros, and you you basically hit on some of them. You know, it's your top picks of fruit, uh, your top picks of barrel. Uh, is there anything else that we want to throw to the sales team to let them know what? It, separates the, the the reserve from the Carneros that was one of the questions we had maybe it's, a couple it's really it's really an exercise in, in in skimming some cream off the top and there's only so much cream you can skim off the top before you start to affect the rest of everything else so um, it's it's a uh, it's an exercise in um, choosing just a, a little bit of the, the very best and uh, seeing what what you can do with it that's a great way to go out and sell the wine. Lauren, uh, you're probably going to hit exactly what I'm eating right now, but go ahead and tell us what this will pair with. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, Steve spoke to the complexity of this wine, and then also it's got more of that silkiness, so it's a little bit softer, so you definitely want to be careful not to overpower it. Um, I think, you know, chicken with kind of a Marion Berry or Marion Blackberry sauce, you know, something a little softer than the cherry would be great. Um, even, you know, a goat cheese and beet salad with a balsamic dressing, I think those would pair really well. We've got the creaminess from the goat cheese that can kind of, you know, mix with those subtle flavors. Well, you didn't hit on anything I was eating, but that's okay. Um, try. I'll just stick with my carnitas tacos. Um, and these, uh, this actually goes really well with carnitas tacos as well. So um, let's, let's jump into some questions because we have lots of great questions. Uh, let's see here. Let me pick one. Um, how old are the vines? Most of these vines were planted in 1996 and 1997, which would make them 25-ish years old, 20, between 20 and 25 years. Great. And um, what's planted percentage-wise? I don't even know if you said exactly the percentage of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir in the vineyards. What, what's the percentage? Our, our vineyards are about 75% Pinot Noir, about 25% Chardonnay, and um, you know, and it really varies where we where we're planting. Uh, so we're, we're looking at the individual spots in the vineyard. We've got a lot of different topography in the vineyard, 
and really the key is to look at what each little spot in the vineyard that we're going to plant on what is that soil what is the site uh the the direction that it's exposed to um how it's sloping how do all of those things influence what would be the best planting choice for that individual spot so we've got the pinot planted in the best places for the Pinot, and then we've tried to choose the best clone for each of those individual spots as well. And uh, same thing with the Chardonnay, where the Chardonnay is going to perform best. We've got that planted and trying to really get the best use of each individual spot where any particular vine is going to go in the ground. Fantastic. You know, I can't believe our 30 minutes is actually up, but we do have uh, more questions. So if you can stick around, please stick around. We're going to continue with more questions. If not, thanks so much for joining us. Um, let's see here. What is the importance of cold soaking? And is there a general rule of thumb for duration? I don't know. Can you put that in a nutshell, Steve? Um, there, there, there's not a general rule. The, the, the idea is, well, one, one thing with Pinot Noir is that it ferments quickly. It, it sits around and stares at you, put some yeast in there, stares at you for a little while, then it decides to ferment and then boom, it's done. So uh, we want to get the appropriate length of time for extraction, where the, the time when the skin is in contact with the juice. And if it's going to ferment really quickly, we, we may not be getting the appropriate uh, time. And we, we also want to get a lot of the extraction early in the fermentation when the, when the skins haven't broken down as much and there's less alcohol in, in the in the wine so when we're soaking the skins in the juice in a cold soak there, there's no alcohol in there you're you're extracting into the juice and at the end of the fermentation you've got skins essentially sitting in wine there's alcohol in there and you can extract different kinds of tannins at, at that point and especially if the skins are breaking down so what we try to do is get a lot of extraction up front before we've started to ferment, and that's the cold soak. Then we'll start the fermentation. So typically by the time the fermentation is complete, we, just when it's going dry is, is when we're done extracting. We've, we've got the appropriate extraction, and right at dryness, we'll, we'll drain and press. That was a great explanation. Thanks, Steve. All right, this one's for Lauren. Um, somebody wants to know when you're going to begin cooking for us because of all your descriptors. You guys are all welcome to come over whenever you'd like. I'll pop some Wimbane open and we can have some dinner or breakfast tacos. <laughs> uh, yeah, breakfast tacos. Don't forget those, the carnitas. Steve, can you give us a little bit more information on the, the types of soil? Uh, I know you touched on them, but um, you said rocky soil. Is there any any other descriptors you can give us in the in, to, to talk about when we're out selling the Ooh, wine? That That's one that would be a, a, a bit of a longer bit of a longer discussion. We've got a, a, quite a few different soil types uh, on, on our estate. Up on the, the hillsides, we've got thin rocky soils. Uh, we've got some high saddles that'll have some more um, sedimentary soil at, at the low spot that leads up to a, that lead, leads up to a, a thin soil. We've got some valley bottom areas that have, have deeper, heavier clay soils in them. So it, it really just depends on the spot. And uh, without a map and a little more, um, a little more technical information, that's, that's not one that's easy to go into just, just off the top of my head. So oh, that, that actually helped out a lot. And, and we can dig in a little deeper. Um, the, Steve and uh, Lauren did give us a video that I posted. So um, you can watch that video and it's actually gonna touch on a lot of the things that we spoke about today. And that'll be on our YouTube page. I believe uh, it was posted uh, yesterday. Um, one last question. What is the ageability of these wines? Should they be drunk young or should we age them for a few years? Uh, we won't release any wines until they're ready to drink. So everything is going to be showing well when it's released. In terms of how long to age it, um, if, if yeah, definite ageability. It, it it depends on how you enjoy your wine. Do you do you like to have more age on it and some more mature character, or do you like it um, younger and 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 fresher? Kind of, I I tend to hang on to these things for you know four to five years is what I've been doing in, in terms of of my drinking schedule. But 
I've, I've got the luxury of doing that. I like to buy two cases of each, one one to drink now and one to save. That's uh, that's the way I explain it whenever I try to sell the wines. Lauren, go ahead. I was just going to say, speaking from experience, I think um, I've had a few of the Windbane Pinots that have been aged for, you know, a few previous vintages, and they're delicious still. Once you open them, it kind of brings out a totally new um, set of characteristics once you, you know, let it sit for a while. That's great. Uh, great wines uh, made in a great way are definitely ageable. So these are definitely great wines. What a what a great collection. We have three amazing wines um, available to uh, show clients. Please show them as much as you can. These wines are, are fantastic. If uh, you have more questions, uh, please email me, Steve or Lauren, and we can get back to you with more questions. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and send it back to you, Lauren, and then Steve to close. Right. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I think, um, you know, it was great to get a chance to pause and talk about Wind Bane today. It's always uh, nice to talk about wonderful wines like these, and I truly appreciate all of Steve's hard work in making them. So thanks for having me. Thanks again for having me out on Friday morning to start my day with, uh, with tasting. It's a great way to start a Friday and giving me the opportunity to taste and, and talk about the Wind Bane wines for all of you guys. And I really hope you guys continue to enjoy them and continue to sell them. And we'll see you on the next seminar. Cheers. Thanks everyone. Cheers. Thank you for joining us, everyone.